If you follow any supplements in the longevity space, you've probably come across urolithin A. It's a little less known supplement, but it is growing in popularity due to some really interesting research. So today I'm gonna to dive into one of the main papers looking at the longevity and lifespan extension benefits of urolithin A. I did write a whole blog on urolithin A recently covering a whole bunch of benefits. So if you wanna check that out, then I'll link down below for that full blog so you can see all of the content related to that. I really went in and tried to find all the available research to date on urolithin A, so really interesting. Um, but yeah, let's dive into it and see what we see as far as the lifespan extension because that's one of the main things for us in the longevity space. Now, keep in mind, a lot of the research, particularly this paper we're gonna look at today, is in worms and rodent models, so we can only extrapolate that what we can. Uh, I don't think to date there is anything in humans looking at lifespan extension, but at least we have you know, a good sort of model looking at worms and rodents. So we'll dive into that, and then we can see where we go with it. Before we get into the actual research for urolithin A, it probably helps to know what exactly this compound is. So I dive into this, as I said, more in my blog, but for a brief overview, basically what urolithin A is is from the family urolithins. Um, that's produced from particular polyphenols called elagitanins and elegic acid, right? So these two compounds here. We can see in a complex way, so when we consume these polyphenols, mostly from things like pomegranate and walnuts, and maybe in some other foods in smaller quantities, we convert these elagitanins into elegic acid, and then in our small intestine and in our large intestine, um, we get conversion of that into different urolithins. And there are different, what are called metabotypes, depending on what species you have in your gut and what they tend to produce for urolithins. So obviously what we're focused on is urolithin A, and the research shows that most of the benefits, or at least the most profound benefits, seem to be from urolithin A, but there is urolithin B and isoeulorithin B. There are different compounds. And so depending on the species that you have on your gut, you may produce different types of urolithins, and these are called your metabotypes. Um, we can actually measure some of these. So I am a practitioner with Microba. Microba does metagenomic stool testing, um, which allows us to see what species are actually in your gut. And they do have uh, some species related to urolithin productions. Um, so we can actually measure that. If you're interested in doing gut testing with me, then you can reach out and uh, jump on my discovery call or book in a consultation with me. And we can actually go down and find if you have some of these species in your gut. The specific species that have been related to urolithin, uh, now bear with me as I work through these names because they're always difficult if you're a microbiologist, you know. Um, but So we've got um, mostly in the family called uh, Agarthalacia Agarthal family, and we have particular genus and species from Gordonobacter, uh, Ergothella, Adlercruetzia, uh, and Elagibacter. So these are some of the main species that we'll find in our gut and in our microbiome that will produce urolithin A. Um, now, depending on if you have those or not, your ability to produce that compound will be quite different. Um, so it helps to sort of know what you have there. Um, but regardless, that's why now we have the supplemental form, the main one being Mitopure, which I'll link below and talk about towards at the end. Um, but if you take it supplementally, supplementally, then you don't really have to worry about what your microbiome composition is because you're getting that compound directly and you're getting the urolithin A specifically. Now, urolithin is a really interesting compound. It's got a lot of different benefits across the entire system, which is great because if we can take one compound that has multi-system benefits, that's gonna save us a lot of money as far as needing supplements that are gonna you know, support different parts of our body. So really interesting that it has research now to show many benefits across. Obviously the one that we're gonna focus on today is the longevity, lifespan, and health span perspective. Um, and note that it even says here in C. elegans. So as I said, most of the research seems to only be in worms at the moment for the longevity benefits. But we can see it's potentially got an inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-cancer, cardiometabolic benefits, a whole range of benefits. So there seems to be really inter interesting research and support for considering adding in urolithin A uh, into your routine. And we'll talk about dosing and um, types towards the end. So make sure you, you stick into that. But let's jump in and actually look at the paper in relation to lifespan. And that's what we really care about if we're talking about longevity and those types of things. So this is the paper we're gonna look at. This is a 2016 paper from Nature, so quite a well-regarded um, journal. And 
I really like this study because they actually measured a lot of different things. So they measured in worms, they measured in vitro in rodent cell culture, and then also in rodents. And they measured a lot of different things to discern what the benefits were and what the mechanisms of the benefits were for lifespan extension. Um, but at the top here, we can see right away um, the main findings of lifespan extension. So in C. elegans, which is the worm, um, they looked at urolithin A, B, C, or D um, in standard concentrations of 50 micromolar, and they found significant improvements in lifespan, mostly with urolithin A. So we can see almost 50%. They also found a dose response effect. So between 10 and 50 micromolar, there was an increased benefit at 50. So that seems to be sort of the major dosing that we wanna look at, and we'll see what that means in humans. Now, as I said, one of the good things with this paper is they measured a lot of different potential pathways. Now, what seems to be the major benefit and mechanism of action of urolithin A is um, improving autophagy and mitophagy. So if you're not familiar with what uh, autophagy is, um, it, this is basically the natural process of our body getting rid of dysfunctional cells. So it breaks them down and then reutilizes the sort of components of that cell to use towards the production of other better functioning cells. Mitophagy is the same thing, but just related to the mitochondria. So when we have mitochondria that aren't functioning well, whether due to, you know, mitochondrial DNA changes, damage, whatever, those mitochondria can become pro-inflammatory and problematic. So they're not producing enough energy and they end up producing a lot of reactive oxygen species. And so dysfunctional mitochondria is one of the key hallmarks of aging. And so if we want to improve across our aging and the main hallmarks, we want to make sure that we have well-functioning mitochondria and that we sort of flush out and get rid of the poor functioning ones. And so mitophagy is really important for that so that we can get rid of those bad functioning ones and the potential reactive oxygen species, and then have um, the ones that are still there functioning at an ideal rate. And we can use the substrates to produce more high functioning mitochondria. And so that's actually what they looked at when they measured a lot of the pathways here. And they actually did some knockout studies. So they would knock out certain pathways in the worms and in the mice to see what was the actual mechanism. And basically what this means is when that pathway is knocked out, they should or should not see a specific change. And so it just confirms um, what they're looking at. And so they did this and they did confirm that a lot of the pathways are related to the mitochondria and mitophagy itself. We won't go into too much detail with the actual pathways, um, but in this picture here, you can see the main thing that they were talking about is this pink one Parkin pathway. There are other ones as well, but basically what happens is we get a uh, improvement in these pathways, which leads to ubiquitination and phosphorylation here. And then we have a ligand attached, um, which ends up leading to lysosome being attached to it and breaking down that mitochondria. So that's sort of the mitophagy component with it. There are other pathways, but that's the main thing. Now, what's interesting, and they go into a lot of detail here, but I'll kind of cover it in a high level. What was interesting is they actually found often, especially in the younger worms, that there was a decrease in the total amount of mitochondria. But then in the longer term or in the older models, they found an improvement in function of those mitochondria that remained. So the respiratory chain that helps produce energy and ATP seemed to be improved, but the total amount of mitochondria was less. So it's almost like the culling of the herd. So it's like a selective pressure. We've gotten rid of all the poor functioning mitochondria and we've kept all of the better functioning ones and the ones that remain seem to have an improved level of function to produce more ATP and the respiratory chain um, seems, sees improvements. Uh, and there's some shift there too for those who wanna sort of dig into the weeds a bit where it seems complex one and the respiratory chain um, gets downregulated and then more from complex two onwards gets upregulated. So less glycolysis um, and more aerobic um, respiration happening from those mitochondria. So as I said, it's great. They really dug into the mechanisms here really, really well to give us a clear understanding of what is the specific pathway and why we're getting that benefit. And then they took this a step further. And as I said, they looked at um, in culture mammalian cells, and then they also did uh, in vivo in rodent models. Uh, and they saw the same thing. So most of the benefits, they saw slight improvement in uh, lifespan but they also saw functional improvement overall in, in health span. And two main things that they looked at was actually in aerobic and muscular capacity. So specifically in the in vivo model, 
uh, down here. So this is where they actually looked at it in rodents. What they found was functional improvements in uh, muscle and aerobic capacity. So, and again, keep in mind this is in mice, but what they found was greater grip strength, so 9%, but more significant is the aerobic capacity. So in this study, 57% greater level of spontaneous exercise. And then in this other regimen here, they saw 42% greater running endurance. So more, it seems, on the aerobic side, which makes sense because if we're having better improved mitochondria and mitochondrial function, then we should see more improvement in aerobic capacity. But it's great to see that they saw functional improvement in muscle, and, and this seems to be regardless of physical changes in the muscle. So they didn't detect any greater density or size of muscle, but yet there seems to be some improvement. And there's been some recent research actually looking at this in human models as well. And there seems to be some benefit to uh, both performance and just overall muscle in humans. But keep in mind um, that a lot of this is looking at elderly populations and older populations. So some of those benefits may not translate across to young, healthy individuals. You know, I'm only not even 40 yet, so I don't know if I would get benefits from it. But definitely as you're getting older or if you're already, you know, past that 65 mark, for maintenance of muscle might be something important to maintain, and there may be some benefit to endurance capacity. And this is where sort of testing, if you're gonna try it out, would be really interesting to see how you go with it. So overall, really interesting research. It seems to be quite promising, at least in its benefits. We get a significant lifespan extension in worms that will obviously be redu uh, reduced in humans, um, but it seems to be similar mechanism, say as calorie restriction. So you could consider urolithin A as a, uh, calorie restriction mimetic in that it works on the same pathways of autophagy and mitophagy. Keeping in mind that, you know, still more research needs to be done in humans to see where it goes, but at least this early research is really um, promising and I think makes it worthwhile of at least trying it and see how you go with it. So if there's something that you want to try, we have two options. Obviously you can do the whole food natural way like we talked about. So pomegranate and walnuts, pomegranate being the primary source. Um, the the issue with that is, of course, you don't know how much urolithin A you're actually going to produce and you don't know what species you may have. So you're not going to get a, a confirmed dosage of urolithin A and it's going to be harder to know if the benefits are from the food or not. And that's where obviously you can have this supplemental form in the one that I mentioned, which is MitoPure. So MitoPure is the main urolithin A supplement on the market, the main clinically validated and tested one. So if you want to try it, I would only go with that product for now until we see other ones come out. The other option is considering something like a seed probiotic, which I'll also link down below. They actually have uh, Indian pomegranate in their symbiotic. So symbiotic being a prebiotic and probiotic. So that prebiotic component has the pomegranate there, which may lead to some urolithin A production. Um, but again, it's not gonna be a confirmed dose, depends on your microbiome. So if you wanted to be more exact and precise with it, you would take the urolithin A directly Based on this research, um, they were looking at an equivalent human dose of about four milligrams per kilo. So we're in the 300s probably for the average male. Um, you can calculate that yourself. I think MitoPure has a dosage of 500. So, you know, a little bit higher is probably not a bad thing to make sure that you're gonna get a sufficient dose, but you can work those out for yourself and see where you go. I think they say anywhere between 500 to even 1,000 you could try out. It's um, generally recognized as safe by the FDA. There doesn't seem to be any side effects of your with an A. So, you can play around with the dose. As I said, the best thing is to test and retest how you actually respond to it. So if you're gonna go down that path, don't just willingly take the supplement and pay a bunch of money and have no idea if it works for you. I would recommend doing things like functional testing. So measuring, say, your grip strength, your overall strength, if you're in the gym, you know, tracking your lifts, see if there's any improvements over months. Um, endurance definitely seems to be the main one. So maybe do a submax or max VO2 test see how your runs go, track them, see if you make any improvement. And then you could look at specific biomarkers, whether looking at you know your lipids, or if you wanted to do more of your longevity, biological age measures, say the true age um, pace or the true age full panel to look at biological age. Those would probably be the main things to test and retest if you're trying your lithin A to see if it makes any improvement at all for you. Those would be the main ones. 
give it a go. If you have tried it, I really, I would be really interested to hear, you know, your experience with it. So leave some comments down below if you have tried it, or if you know someone who's tried it and they've had their own experiences with it, I'd love to hear. I haven't tried it yet. It's on my list of things to try and test out. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear about your, your responses and your thoughts about this compound as well. And any other ideas or comments, I'm always welcoming um, those down below. So leave them there and we can start a chat going with it. All right, so that's looking at your lithin A and longevity and lifespan. As I said, I've got a full blog post. So if you want to see more research and more details across the other benefits of your lithin A, check that out. It will be down, uh, linked down below for you. Um, outside of that, make sure to like and subscribe and support the channel so I can keep putting some of this content out. And if you have other ideas or other compounds that you want me to do a deep dive into, please leave a comment below and I'll do my best to look into those. All right, see you on the next video.